Hello and welcome everyone to this video podcast for evolution and diversity. For evolution and diversity. In this podcast, we're going to carry on our discussion of phylogenies and we're going to talk about how we can look at a phylogeny and make some estimates. In doing so, I'd, I'd like to first introduce some new terms, homology and homoplasy, and also the difference between ancestral and derived characteristics. And there's going to be some other terms and um, topics mixed in with these first two here. And that will ultimately lead to our, our final topic, and that is how we use that information to estimate a phylogeny. Let's go ahead and move forward and start talking about homologies and homoplasies. All right, so let's begin our discussion of homology and homoplasy. It's important to remember that when we infer certain evolutionary relationships, say on a phylogenetic tree, we do so by comparing the traits of the species. So let's spend a little bit of time thinking about traits. So let's begin this discussion with the word character. The word character has lots of meanings, but when we use it in biology, this is what we mean. Simply, it's a heritable trait p possessed by an organism. For instance, an example of a character might be hair. That is the character. Okay, now let's go ahead and think about this term here called character state. And this is one of the possible different conditions of a character. So as an example, if hair is a character, a character state would be hair present versus hair absent. So for instance, here's a picture of my family, at least part of my family. This is me, this is my brother. I have no hair, he has hair. That would be the character state of hair between myself and my brother. Now with the idea of what a character is, let's now move on to our discussion of homology versus homoplasy. Okay, so let's begin this discussion with some definitions. Homology. Homology is when similar characters are derived from common ancestors. A classic example of this is the forelimb of vertebrates. Before I start talking about the forelimbs of vertebrates, I want to talk about the way that we would see homology work on a phylogenetic tree. And the angiosperms, that is the flowering plants, provides a great example for this. Here we see a common ancestor that had the trait of flowering, and then all of its descendants also have that trait. Water lilies, wild roses, and everything in between would have flowers. So all of these organisms here have the trait of flowering that can be traced back to a, a common ancestor. So we talked about this earlier in the semester, but I think it's important to remind ourselves how the forelimb and vertebrates is a good example of homology. You can look at a human, a cat, and a whale, and you'll see similar structures like the humerus, the radius, the ulna, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. They have a, a similar shape, and they have a similar function as well. There's just some differences when it comes to overall size and some slight changes in the structure. And while I did say they have a similar function, that, that is true, but overall function is also quite different. So this is homology. And we would say these are homologous structures. Now let's think about the term homoplasy. This is when a similar character is not inherited from a common ancestor. Some good examples of this would be comparing a dolphin with the now extinct ichthyosaur, the ability to fly, Birds and bats can both fly, but they did not inherit that character from a common ancestor. And one last one here would be a pill bug and a pill millipede. So let me so, show you some pictures of what I'm talking about. So here's the common dolphin that we see today and the ichthyosaur. Now they have this very nice streamlined body structure. However, the common ancestor did not have the streamlined structure of their body, or fins or flippers. In addition, other related species also do not have that same body plan or fins or flippers as we see in evolutionary trees. The best way to explain why these two dolphins are similar in their body structure and their fins and flippers is that they evolved that character independently. Dolphins you can see here and ichthyosaurs here. Some differences, the ichthyosaur is much larger, about twice the size, 
than the common dolphin, but they have the same body plan. So that tells us, as both of these were evolving, the dolphin and the ichthyosaur, that they had similar evolutionary pressures, which resulted in a similar body. Another example is comparing bats and birds. Now, their bone structures are still homologous, as we talked about before, but the ability to fly is not homologous, rather it is homoplastic. We know that birds can fly, and we know that bats can fly, but their common ancestor here, there's no evidence that it could fly. So both bats and birds had to independently derive this character. And as I said with the dolphin and ichthyosaur, it, it suggests that birds and bats may have had similar evolutionary pressures. And the last example here are the pill bug and the pill millipede. They look pretty similar, but if you've ever seen a pill bug, which I'm sure you have, you know if you tap on them, they roll up into this protective ball. And the pill millipedes also do the same thing. However, they do not share a common ancestor that was able to do that. So again, their ability to curve into a, a protective ball was derived independently. They did not have that common ancestor with that ability. Okay, as we consider homoplastic structures, I think it's important that we define a new term, and this new term is convergent evolution. And this is the independent evolution of similar traits in distantly related organisms due to, adapt due to adaptations to similar environments and lifestyles. So convergent evolution provides an explanation to how homoplastic traits arise. But again, a very important thing to remember is that these two independent traits that are similar, the reason they were able to arise is because they were exposed to the same similar environments and lifestyles that led to those evolutionary pressures. So let's think about, okay, now the next question is, how are we going to use these terms? That is, when we see characters in different organisms, like the complex eye that we see in an octopus, a ray finned fish, a hippopotamus, or a crocodile, are those, did those structures evolve through homology or through homoplasy? So let's focus on the octopus and the ray finned fish to first see if these two structures were formed through homology or homoplasy. To answer this question, we need to consider this new term here called parsimony. And that is the least number of steps to construct a phy phylogeny. What this means is we're going to look at these characters of eye development in just a moment and see how many steps it would take if it arose through homology and how many steps it would take if it arose through homoplasy. Whichever one has the fewest number of steps, that's going to be the one that is the most likely to explain why different an animals have a similar character. So let's consider the example that the complex eye, the camera eye, evolved from a common ancestor that is through homology. And let's count the number of steps that would make sense for this to have occurred. So if this common ancestor had this complex camera eye, one can easily see how that would have been maintained in the vertebrates. However, if that is true, then it would have had to have been lost in the kinoderms, and it would have had to have been lost in the arthropods and the roundworms, and the rotifers and the flatworms and the segment of worms, and it would have persisted here in the mollusks. So in order for this camera eye to have evolved from a common ancestor, we would have had to have had one, two, three, four, five evolutionary events to build this phylogenetic tree. In addition, it should be noted that when a trait or character is lost, there is some evidence of that in the fossil record. It wouldn't have just been lost quickly overnight, right? It would have taken many generations, thousands of years for it to have been lost. So we should have seen this transition in the fossil record, and we just don't see that. If this arose by homoplasy, let's see how many evolutionary steps it would have taken. Again, remember, if it's through homoplasy, we're not looking for a common ancestor to have it. We're saying that it would have evolved independently of a common ancestor. And so in order for that to have happened, we would have needed two steps. It would have gained this advanced camera eye in the vertebrates, and it would have also gained it in the mollusks. We would have had to have independently lost it in all these other species, 
because it was never there. And so with homoplasy, there are two independent evolutionary events that would have had to have occurred. And that seems much more likely than having five independent evolutionary events. And again, the fossil record also supports homoplasy. Just like I said before that the eye wouldn't have been lost overnight when we're talking about homology, as we're talking about here in homoplasy, also remember that from this common ancestor that didn't have the eye to vertebrates who do now have the eye, that also did not occur quickly or overnight, right? That took a lot of time. And we see evidence of that in the fossil record going from a very simple eye to a much more complex eye. Now, before we move on from our discussion of, of homology and homoplasy, I wanted to say one more thing, and that is that even though we do get some nice information when we identify these homoplastic traits, like the eyes, only the homologous traits actually give us any information about the evolutionary relationship between species. So when we think about homologous traits, we do need to think about if the traits are ancestral or derived. So here's a phylogenetic tree, but for now let's just remind ourselves of a few things. One is that horses and monkeys, they are one of the monophyletic groups. Lizards, horse, and monkeys are also a monophyletic group from our discussions before. And bass, lizard, horse, and monkey are also another separate monophyletic group. And I didn't leave myself enough room up here, but I'll just kind of squeeze it in here. But what makes them fit into these different monophyletic groups? Let's think about the horse and the monkey. They form a separate monophyletic group because the horse and monkey had a common ancestor that had hair and mammary glands. These are just two features that their ancestors had to have derived, but we would call this a derived trait because it is not a trait that was found in a previous ancestor. Any trait that would be common to all of these would be an ancestral trait. And we could think of a lot of things that would link these all together, but certainly they're all eukaryotes. That might be the ancestral trait. They're all animals. Could also be that link. So for the monophyletic group of horse and monkey, the trait that makes them horses and monkeys is hair and mammary gland. That is a new trait, that is a derived trait. Lizards, bass, and lobsters do not have that trait. I'm gonna throw another term out at you, and that is synapomorphy. I guess it's not a new term, we did mention this before, but I wanna bring it up again because it fits in this discussion well. So these are shared derived traits. These would also be considered homologous traits. Hair and mammary glands are homologous traits found in horses and monkeys. We use these synapomorphies to define a group like this. In this case, to define this monophyletic group. So let's look at the synapomorphy that would have defined the lizard, horse, and monkey monophyletic group. And that would be four limbs and an amniotic egg. Four limbs and an amniotic egg is a synapomorphy that categorizes lizards, horses, and monkeys into that monophyletic group. Four limbs and an amniotic egg, these are also derived traits. Because these are traits that have derived from the initial ancestral traits. So what synapomorphy helps define or categorizes bass, lizard, horse, and monkeys into that monophyletic group. And that is that they all have vertebrae and jaws. And of course, many other things that link them together. These are just some examples. And these would be the synapomorphies that define these four taxa. And as we said with the other traits, these are also derived traits because they are not found in the ancestor down here. I'm gonna erase a little bit of this just to make some room. There's one more term I would like to define here, and that is plesiomorphy. These are traits that are shared by the out group, which in this case would be the lobsters. Remember, these are all sister groups because they are the focus of this study that we're talking about. Plesiomorphy, again, are the traits shared by the out group. We could also think of these as the ancestral traits as is found in the ancestral organism. So as a quick review, synapomorphies, as are highlighted here in orange, blue, and green, 
are derived traits that help identify and classify organisms in certain groups, such as in certain monophyletic groups. Traits that are only found in the ancestor and the outgroup, these would be called plasmorphic traits. They are ancestral traits. All right, let's go ahead and carry our discussion a little further with synapomorphies and use that information to estimate a phylogeny. And these synapomorphies, or the characters that define the synapomorphies, and I sometimes will interchange the word character and trait, and, and for the most part, I'm meaning the same thing. Character and traits are used, as we talked about on the last whiteboard, to identify these synapomorphies. But these characters can be one of a ver several varieties. They can be morphological, physiological, behavioral, or molecular. And when we're thinking about molecular, we're either going to look at the DNA sequence or protein sequence. We're going to start with morphological. And to make life a little bit easier, I'm going to give you this table. And we're going to use this table to construct a phylogeny. What you see here are the different taxa that we're studying, from lancelets to lamprey, bass, frog, turtles, and leopards. And then we have the different characters that are going to define the synapomorphies. And we're going to use these characters to build that phylogenetic tree and to understand the phylogenetic relationship between these organisms. Okay, so let's go ahead and start building this phylogenetic tree. And I'm going to start with the lancelet because we know it's the outgroup. And so we know it's going to have all the characteristics of the original ancestral organism. Now we know that from this ancestral organism, there was one change, and that is that a vertebral column is a trait, a synapomorphy that formed. So let's go ahead and put that in here. And I'm just going to put VC for vertebrate column. And with this vertebrate column, when it evolved, it led to the lamprey, but of course then to everything else. So how are we going to draw this everything else? Well, we're going to think about what makes the lamprey different than the bass. And what makes the lamprey different than the bass is that it has a hinged jaw. And I'm just going to put HJ here for hinged jaw. That's what makes the bass different than the lamprey, is this synapomorphy of a hinged jaw. And then that is what led to the bass. Now the next organism here that's going to be the next derived is going to be the frog. And what makes the frog different than the bass? It has four walking legs. And I'm just going to put the number four here for four walking legs. Now what makes the frog different than the turtle. Well, the turtle derived a certain characteristic that is the amnion. And I'm just going to put A here because I'm really running out of room. But we know that that led to the turtle. And then what's the difference between the turtle and the leopard? Well, there's a lot of things different between a turtle and a leopard. But one thing listed on this table here is the presence of hair. And so we have hair. And I'm just going to put an H there for hair for the leopard. So by looking at all these traits and seeing which of these traits are found in each of these organisms, we can build a tree like this. And as you're going through this, as, a, as I started off, I started off with the outgroup, the lancelet. And then as I tried to make a decision between what was the next organism that was closest related to the lancelet, which was the lamprey, what made it different? It had a vertebral column. And then again, what made the bass different than the lamprey? Hinge jaw and just kept building it downwards like this. If you get one of these on an exam that is based upon morphology, it will not be any more complicated than this. And remember earlier I said that we could estimate these phylogenies using morphological synapomorphies, but also we can do it using protein or DNA sequence. And I'm going to talk real briefly here about how we can use DNA sequences. Okay, so Let's consider DNA sequences. And let's say we want to know the phylogenetic relationship between humans, chimpanzees, orangutans, cows, dogs, and rats. And let's say we have this gene that we know is found in all these species. And if we wanted to know how closely these species were related to each other, we would sequence this gene and determine how different they were. And in this case here, when we sequence them, the humans, chimps, orangutans, cows, and dogs, and rats gene here, the scientists discovered that there were three nucleotides that were different compared to chimps and humans. Orangutans had five nucleotides that were different. Cows 
had 18 nucleotides that were different. Dogs had 17 nucleotides that were different. And rats had 20 nucleotides that were different. I should mention that when I said this gene, I'm not talking about just any old gene. I'm talking about a gene that we would say is well conserved. Meaning that it hasn't changed much throughout evolution. Strange and little as you can see here, but not a lot. We could now use this information here to build our phylogenetic tree. And so we're comparing every, all of these to the humans. So we're gonna put humans here. And then what we wanna ask is, what's the next organism that is the closest to it? And that would be chimps. Then what's the next one after that? Orangutans, I'm just gonna put OR there. And then what's the next one? It's dogs, it's pretty close to cows, but in this case it's dogs. They have 17 nucleotides that are different than humans. Then cows. And then finally, everyone's favorite, the rat. So let's consider this phylogenetic tree a little bit more now. And remember, we constructed this phylogenetic tree by looking at the sequence differences in a specific gene. And I'm just gonna draw a generic gene here under each of these common ancestors. We know throughout the process of evolution that our DNA picks up new mutations. The longer time has passed, the more mutations it will have. So if we look at a human gene, and we're just gonna call that zero, because there's no differences between a human gene and another human gene, because we're comparing everything to our friends here, the humans. What we're saying is, at the time that the chimpanzees branched off at this branch point, branched off from this common ancestor, between that point there and humans, there's been three nucleotide changes. There have been three mutations in this one gene between the time chimpanzees and humans split off from each other. Orangutans, what we're saying here is that between the time that this common ancestor of orangutans and humans and chimps, that there have been five nucleotide changes. So there's been a greater distance of time between the time the orangutans broke off and humans compared to chimps and humans. It's a longer time, so you're gonna have more mutations. Same thing with dogs. Dogs, there are 17 nucleotides that have changed. Now, of course, 17 is more than five, so that tells us that there's been a longer time between the time that dogs separated from humans than the time that orangutans separated from humans, because there's more nucleotide changes. More mutations have occurred. And then with cows being 18 nucleotides apart, not as many changes have occurred. So they're a little closer related, but still it tells us it's been a little bit longer since cows diverged from the line that would be humans. And then finally, my friend the rat here, that's 20 nucleotides. So in just comparing rats and humans, it tells us that rats are further removed from humans than any of these other species. Now we could go further and look at other organisms that also have this gene, but the study itself just stopped with the rat. And so it's a nice way to determine the evolutionary relationship between different species using something we like to call a molecular clock because DNA changes over time because of mutations. Okay, that's all I have for you for this podcast. If you have any questions at all, please make sure you come see me. If not, I will see you in class. Bye for now.